Mr. Pawan Kalyan, who has lovingly been given the title of Power Star by all you fans, is truly the king of Tollywood. But behind the stardom lies a very simple and humble human being who's driven more to serving people and society than to celebrate box office records. Mr. Kalyan, who has an incredible following amongst the youth, prefers to be seen as one amongst the common man than as a privileged star of society. It is this philosophy of his, the Pavanism, as it is known, <laughs> that is the core value of his party, Jan Sena. He truly is the most powerful common man. Through his political career and with the support of his fans and party supporters, who are presumably his soldiers in arm, he hopes to do good for the people of his state. And that is perhaps what makes him a true power star. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Pavan Kalyan. నేను ఈరోజు నా రాష్ట్ర ప్రభుత్వాలు కానీ కేంద్ర ప్రభుత్వాలు కానీ అడిగేది ఒక క్రానిక్ గా ఒక ప్రాంతం వేలాది మంది దశాబ్దాలుగా చనిపోతున్నప్పుడు ఇది ఏ ఒక్క ప్రజాప్రతినిధి దృష్టికి ఎందుకు వెళ్ళలేదు He should be here any minute. He's just backstage. I bow and my, pay my respects to the God particle within each one of you. And it's an honor to be at Harvard, to be one of the keynote speakers. And I thank the student body who could make it happen. And I whole, uh, wholeheartedly uh, thank you, all of them. Thank all of you. And it's a bit a new experience to me to be in this kind of platforms. It's 
comfortable and easy for me to address a, a lack of people, but to come to Harvard and to face thinking minds is not an easy task. So it took me some time to ponder whether I actually could communicate what I believe in and what I stand for. It took me some time, so finally I had accepted. That's why I'm here. And today this video, the subject would be the global power, India's rising global power. But I can't talk about entire India because my experiences are confined, though I know a lot about India, but my political experiences or my uh, political realm is only within uh, on the state of Andhra Pradesh and the state of Telangana. So I would like to say, I would like to communicate from within Andhra Pradesh and Telangana perspective. But to talk about the global power, first I would like to what we lack in our country, there is amazing divisiveness in our country. We don't feel as one unit. For me, the reason why I came into politics was I could see the divisiveness, how it is hampering the progress. And all of us, we believe we belong to one sect, one class, or one region, or one religion, but we don't feel the complete Indianness. We don't feel for example, the North Indian leadership, they don't know much about South India. For example, Gandhiji traveled all over India. He knows nook and corner of India. Today, how many leaders, either from South or from North, actually know about the entire India? Today, I know more about America and more about West, uh, what is happening in the West than what exactly happening in the eastern part of India, Assam or Nagaland or Sikkim. For me, my pain is the way we had achieved freedom with a lot of blood and toil, a lot of sacrifices. And the kind of passiveness our society shows. So many problems are there. Recently, I'd been to one part of uh, Andhra Pradesh. It's called Srikakulam District. Uh, one particular area is called Uddhan. No one knows, not even the government, they have an idea. For the last 20 years, around more than 20,000 people died out of kidney disease. And it is some kind of, uh, I don't know why they're, what exactly causes that kidney disease in the people who are living in that, around, living in that, uh, that, within that area, no one knows. Even I think one or two people came from Harvard and they made a, some kind of research, but somehow, they could not completely zero down this could be the problem. And none of the political parties could address the issue. And constantly, the people were suffering. They were very poor. And no one, is a, their voice was not able to reach the government. So somehow they had approached me when I went there. I could, after seeing their pain, after seeing what they're going through, when I addressed the issue, at least the government, government machinery had moved and try, uh, trying to do something now. And this is the plight of our nation, and this is the kind of complacent attitude what our political leadership does to our country and to our state. And for me, and, uh, for me this is, uh, deeply pains me. And constantly we feel the pride of our country and we feel so much always we, we can show us, uh, like our nationalism through a form of cricket, but actually no one addresses the true issues of India. And for me, the pain is all about we really highlight the best of India. But deep down there are so many issues. I'm talking about today about India is a global power, a rising power. They talk about the development. India is really developing. We can show the in data and statistics to say that India is at a growth of this percentage and that percentage. But in reality, to whom, to which group, this development is actually reaching? And we can promise 
in every, po every political situation, they say that they're going to promise, that we're going to bring down the moon for you. We're going to show this. But actually, in reality, people don't ask for big things. In 2007, I was working for another political party, an outfit of, uh, which was uh, established by my brother. When I went there in a district in Telangana state, it, is, it, was a complete, it is a complete tribal district. And like any other guys, even my party people told me, please, you have to address, uh, let us go to one of the tribal villages, let us see that what we, as a party what we can do for them. And first time, I had seen people struggling because they're saying that we're going to give you the best schools, we're going to give you the best education, we're going to do that. And as the, all the election rhetoric. So after some time, there was an old lady uh, who was like you know, blinded right from her childhood. She was around 60 years old. And first time till then, I never knew uh, people without eyeballs, actually, they can cry. I never came into my experience. I'm not a science student to understand. First time that lady was crying, I said, guys, I don't know what you're going to do, but I, we need just water. They're requesting for to have a basic water, nothing else. We don't want anything. We need drinking water. To get a drinking water, we had to go all the way to a few kilometers away, and we are struggling. Could you get us water? That deeply pained me. But like I heard about it, I went back to another constituency, and they put a, just a few kilometers away. I'm talking about uh, from that place, it is the next meeting I went, it was of 60 kilometers away, and they put a, this kind of mineral water bottle in front of me, and I felt so guilty. There, there, lacking of water. Here, I get a mineral water. I felt uh, like a criminal. And I know somehow I lost interest in the political process. I only told my friends and someone who were following me, I said, can we do something till we get into whether we don't know whether we're going to win or not, but at least can we do something about it? And luckily, a few friends came forward and some uh, water who could identify water bodies underground, they were there. And within no time, they could dig a bow well. In the one next, next one week, they had a drinking water there. For me, here, what I'm trying to tell you is, if I, as an individual, if I could do that much, can you imagine the power of machinery? Can you imagine the power of government, what, they could, what they're capable of doing? Then I said, what made them not to go ahead and do it? Because nobody, not that I'm saying the entire political class is like that, but majority, they don't have great interest. For them, what is the next move? What is the next way? To, earn, uh, to get benefits. It is like the apple polishing attitude of our political class is really denying the development of the underprivileged. And this is what really pains me. And if you ask me like, to do, talk about how the global emergence of, like, you know, how India can rise as a global power, I don't have that kind of experience, and there are enough experts, there are enough intelligent intellectuals are there who has a better idea about it. What I can say is, I can speak on behalf of common men, because I had been there, I lived there, and I come from a lower middle class background, and finally I became an actor, and I could, I'd like to address these issues, and so that I know the pain of each one. And we talk about women empowerment. For me, there are a few key issues which I would like to bring it to your notice today. One is about the women empowerment. There is heavy budget for everyone and everything. And women empowerment in our schools, there is no personal hygiene for growing girl, ch girl children. And they have enough money, and somehow it does not reach them. That's the problem there. And today, we want women are the biggest force. We want to empower women. And first of all, you have to give them a healthy lifestyle. Even the so-called uh, social uh, welfare hostels are there. And they're heavily being neglected. 
And these are the issues which are burning issues. And also the major problem in India is the women's safety. The women's safety is such a big concern. And what Gandhi says, in the middle of the night, a woman could really walk, that would be the right, that's, a, that's where we had achieved the freedom. But in reality, even in daytime, if someone has to go, that's quite a risky situations out there, even in my own kit and kin, what they go through. So for me, what I wanted to do is, first of all, we should have a great, very powerful law and order situation should be there. Law and order should be really control, have a, a great say in safeguarding women. To get one Nirbhaya Act, when I say yesterday, it is passiveness which really pulls back India. To get one Nirbhaya Act, because right from my childhood I had seen, because I grew up with my sisters and aunts, I know that how they used to suffer. They never used to feel safe to go out on the roads. To get one Nirbhaya Act, it took government for 60 years plus. That too, it has to happen in Delhi. Unless it happens in Delhi, they don't wake up. <laughs> Everything cannot happen in Delhi to make them understand. They have to feel the country. They have to feel the pulse of the country. They have to feel the pulse of people, which is missing. And recently, I was talking about the for example, the state has been divided. I come from uh, unified Andhra Pradesh. When the state has been divided, what they did was, right from 69 to 72, both the states want to get separated. This is an example I'm saying, how the, past, how the complacent attitude of our political class. It took them, from 69 to 72, both the states wanted to get separated. They want to have their independent uh, state. But somehow, the government, central government said uh, they made them to be together. After some time, they had their own problems, different because they could never, whatever they had promised to make them together, no one had fulfilled. So what exactly happened? Within no time, by the time I was growing, they started hating. Imagine the same language. We speak the same language. We, just the dialect is different. And they started, and a lot of the problem is, the, whatever they had been promised, it was not fulfilled. Suddenly, the anger was being shown on another region people, which is no fault of theirs. I don't belong to that generation. I don't, I don't know what exactly happened around 40 years back. It was not under my control. But the brunt, but I'm facing the pr problem today. Somehow, it was quite a painful, because why we will say India has to be one? We should feel the oneness here. One way they say in India, the Constitution says we should be together. We should, buy, we, should, we should be as one individual entity and force. But in reality, they keep on dividing. As long as the divisive politics or vote bank politics are there, these kind of issues keep arising. And India's progress will be constantly will be getting, taking a back step. We go one step forward with this kind of divisive and vote bank politics, constantly accept, accepting, I mean, constantly looking at people as a vote bank. For me, I, I know a lot of political, political leaders, they don't look at people as people. People are filled with emotions, people are filled with a lot of pain, people are filled with love. But what they look at them is, that's my vote bank. This particular caste is my vote bank. The particular region is my vote bank. They don't see them as humans. In politics, we should get a human angle. They are filled with emotion. They are filled with love and affection. We have to address that issue. Unless we address the individual as we have to recognize as individuals, not as a vote bank. Till we do it, India is going to get affected by this kind of divisive politics, this kind of vote bank politics. And When I, after seeing this, because for me, the reason why I came into politics was, I don't want another generation, the future genera generations has to suffer like me. I don't want them to suffer. I don't, today I'm, I, mean, I'm, I live a comfortable life. I don't, there is no need for me to come. But I said, as, for me, I felt like a service. I can't ignore, I'm a thinking mind. I said, I feel painful. I feel extremely 
like sad looking at the plight of a situation. Somehow what best I can do, I don't have strength and I, am not, I don't belong to any uh, huge political party, I'm not extremely rich. But I said, what best I can do within my means? Then I established the party and I started highlighting each and every issue. Knowingly, getting into politics is like, it's a battle which cannot be won and a destination which cannot be reached. I know it and still I came into politics to serve my nation and to serve our people. When we talk about development, we, we should understand, we have to define development. Development is for each individual means different. For me, a lady in Adilabad, her development is only a water every day. That's her development. For someone else, it is another kind of uh, development. Maybe a housewife, it is nothing but to get her TV all right. And for a student, maybe a simple student, he needs a playground to play. This is what development means. Here we say that we, India is rising, India is achieving great standards, but the standards are not reaching to the majority of our Indians. And that's why you can see, even in Tamil Nadu or other states, you have to understand why these large youthful protests are happening. Today we talk, we talk about the uh, DVM, uh, like uh, the, uh, dividend. The great uh, people of 19 to 20, demographic dividend, we want to reap the de uh, demographic dividend. But actually, in reality, what exactly we are doing for them? People don't do anything for them. They just plan. They keep on saying so many things. They keep on, like, we're going to do for this, we're going to do for youth. They announce a lot of measures, but actually, in reality, how much it is translating to whom it is reaching are two different things. That's why today, if you look at, in Tamil Nadu, maybe I don't know how many of you know about it, lakhs of people came for Jalika, which is a traditional game of Tamils, to tame a bull. But the undercurrent reality, which I was there a few months before, they were saying that there is amazing restlessness in our state because the political situation is so volatile and no one is focusing on the crowd, and very soon they're going to vent out in a different form. We don't know in which form. And we could see that Jallikattu is, we should not see as a mere anger on taming the bull, like, you know, when the Supreme Court said against taming the bull. It's not just about that. It is their frustration. Mere, you want to reap the demographic dividend. Unless we identify them, we recognize them, and unless we channelize their energy, till now, India is going to give India is going to see a rise of this kind of protest, including Andhra Pradesh and including Telangana, and including even recently had seen in Gujarat. This is what is going to happen. This has to be addressed. And we talk about, and one more thing we, India has to focus is on education. And we look at most of the India is rural India and urban India. In urban, there are a lot of sectors. And if you look at each school, the urban schools, there is no one out there. There are no right playgrounds. There are no right facilities, including when I was growing up, I never had a playground in my own school. I thought it was confined to my times or it was confined then, but actually, even if you look at it right now, all the urban areas doesn't have a playground. And here we want to reap the advantage of demographic dividend, yet we, don't even, we can't even provide a basic playground to our own children. And not even, a, not, thing, not even a state government or a central government actually doesn't look at it. In which way, if we keep on ignoring all this, in which way we're going to reap the demographic dividend, in which way we can raise to reach that, to, how can we become the global power if we don't correct ourselves? My purpose is not to undermine, but unless we highlight our issues, unless we highlight our flaws, what exactly are happening, unless we correct them, it is going to be the difficult, it's going to be a very a difficult challenge. What's happening in our country is, as progress, we take one step forward and we create a situation, we go back two steps. That's what is happening in our country. For example, demonetization. We are going at such a beautiful pace when the demonetization announced. What happened was, in my own, 100 people died within our country. And all these people who died were Nothing to do with the law. They, they were not corrupt. They were simple, middle-class, hardworking people. And they are the ones who died. 
and including in my own state, a man who I later got to know their family, that old man went there, look, I'm going to get some money from the banks, just staying in a queue for two days to get his money drawn, to draw his money, to withdraw his money, waited for so many hours, and he died out of a heart attack. And these are the things which, will, which are actually hampering the growth of our nation, because without having any, ex without doing a proper exercise, if you try to do, enforce this kind of laws, this kind of situ pass this kind of laws, the damage is going to be much more. And these are the things which all of us have to address. And today we talk about, you have to understand the kind of political, demonetization actually is aimed for people, for black money. Who has the black money? It is not a normal, an average Indian citizen has black money. In which way they're going to get the money? It is from, normally in irrigation projects, the really big irrigation projects in lakhs of crores or thousands of crores, a very, very small project. But the money, the major money would be taken away from the project. It goes into the certain groups, certain people who are more closer to the political class or who are nearer to closer to governments, the money goes to them. And they are the ones who are storing up the money. And imagine recently when they said voluntary disclosure scheme in, uh, in the Central Government of India announced, and from my own state, the guy says, I have 10,000 crores to announce. You ask them, I said, from where that guy gets money from? It is a collection of, it is like he's a, a center point. He's just a face for a lot of political people who siphoned off a lot of national wealth and kept with him, and they wanted to project him as their man, that he's the one. But actually, the money belongs to a lot of politicians who had siphoned of money from the irrigation projects. And there is no check on that. And we don't, we have, we can't enforce laws on them. The max demonetization by doing it, who got affected, the normal men, but the real culprits already, they're free, they have nothing to do with them, and they're happily on the roads that no one is going to do anything to them. And this is the plight of our country. And with all this, in which way, unless we correct all this, it is very difficult for us to go ahead and to become global power. Unless we correct this, unless we correct the problems within our country, unless we punish the people who are the perpetrators and who are the ones who siphons of this national wealth, and it's going to be very difficult to, to reach the target of being a global power. And for me, the biggest thing in our country is the law is applied weakly to the strong and strongly to the weak. And there's so many incidents are there. A person shoots and can get away. Imagine a simple guy, a, a normal guy, who comes, in a, even in a one way, without a helmet, he'll be punished so hard, but real people who has influence, who has that political affiliation, they shoot people and they get a very nominal punishment. Some, most of the cases don't even go to the courts. Somewhere they're confined to hospitals. That's it, they don't go beyond that. And this is what happens in our country. And people who cheat banks, and they are completely in having shoulder to shoulder with our uh, big leaders. And in which way, in which way we can enforce, we can, in which way we can control people, in which way we can, uh, we can make people listen. Because the top, who are at the top of the, top of the pyramid, if they themselves are doing mistakes, in which way people are going to listen to them? And also the way people loot the national treasure, the way the people loot the wealth of the nation, including uh, recently he said, a few years back, if you look at in Ballari, there are a lot of mines who are supposed to pay a lot of taxes and extract the iron ore. What they did was they take permission for a, person, a, small, poor, a small mining area and they were excavating the entire area without even paying taxes. The taxes, the, the the paid, which is supposed to go to banks, which is supposed to go to government, and it is going into the pockets, and the development is getting, taking a back step there. And those are the guys who are
taking the shelter of politicians. And unless we correct all this, India is going to get affected. It is going to be pull, pulling down. It's going to be pulling down for a country which is, wants to emerge a superpower unless we correct ourselves. These are the issues which had to be handled. And as I said, law and order is the issue. And the greatest chance in India is to promote uh, uh, tourism. And there's a great possibility within our diversified cultures and the vast the kind of geographic uh, advantage we have. We have the less uh, tourist uh, percentage. The reason being, one is, as a culture, we, uh, we don't welcome, uh, though we can really welcome people at, uh, to make them as stakeholders, the major problem is the safety. Unless we seek, we give great security, a great safety for the tourists, as uh, unless we strengthen the civil society, we can't be controlled, we, only police cannot do that. Unless the civil society gets strengthened, unless we make everyone as a stakeholder to give that kind of protection for the tourists in different aspects, as if you make them as stakeholders, that would be a great advantage. And for me, if we want India to be really on the top of the tourism, we have to do really enforce very stringent laws to safeguard women. And women's safety is the priority even for the tourists, unless we feel that unless we create that image out of India, Indian tourism will get affected. And Indian government and people, and as every state government, really should focus on the women's safety and also for the safety of tourists who come to India, and that is going to give a great boost to our tourism. See, for me, the youth leadership, today we want to talk about the demographic dividend. For me, what I'm doing is, every, country, every party looks at youth as political vote bank. In reality, in India, youth means politicians and their families and their grandchildren and their grandchildren. That's it. There is no leadership. <laughs> So for me, my biggest challenge, which I'm struggling, which I'm striving, which I'm making an attempt, is how to build up that youth leadership. And if you have to understand, there is a great capacity in Indian youth. We can't just mere see them as individuals, our workforce. They're the creative force of our country. They are the driving force of our country. And that's what the force had to be tapped, unless we inspire them, unless we become the leading examples unless we become the embodiment of what we believe in, they're not going to come forward. And for me, every party should address, look at youth as someone, as a creative force, it's not just as a word bank. That's what I believe in, and that's what I'm striving, that's what I'm trying to do in 2019 for Genesis. And in spite of all these adverse conditions what we have, for me, always I believe in the saying that adversity reveals true character. With all these challenges, I still believe if we become as one, we can be the global power and the whatever our inter intentions are, wherever we want to reach, we can be really the guiding force for this world. And the one major thing which I would like to say, and I would like to uh, close it is, for Telangana and Andhra, because I keep on referring to this issue on purpose, one of the pol senior political leaders said, though both the states were together as one unit, but as a culture, they haven't merged. Enter India, 
though they say as one, still we don't have the cultural integrity, which is very essential. For me, I keep on addressing these issues from time to time. A guy in Bihar, a guy in UP, don't know much about southern part of India. They don't know much about Tamil Nadu, the leaders I'm talking about. And also, at the same time, the people from the southern states, they don't have a great idea about what's happening there. This is the way, unless we integrate our cultures, we have a Max Muller Bowen to understand Germany. We have a Lens Francis to understand France. We don't have any kind of cultural centers within our India to understand each other, which is the essential. <laughs> which is really needed. The reason is the re-emergence of, re-emerging, like you know, the recrudescence of identity politics is on the rise. This is going to impact the integrity of a nation. Unless our leaders and our political parties come together as one unit, unless they don't address these cultural differences and identity, and it is going to create a lot of pro pro problems. And that's the reason I want to bring it to your notice as that culturally, somehow all of us should make an effort to understand each other, which is really needed to feel as one India and to make it to, to take it to at a global level. Really the kind of global power we are looking at to become the global power, unless we feel as one, unless we culturally we are as one unit, it would be very difficult to take it forward. And before finishing this, India is a passive society. Whatever happens, that does, in fact, recently I was talking about a women's safety, I keep saying in Bangalore, a woman was being molested in the middle of the road, and the onlookers were just looking at as if they're not a part of it. None has the guts, none has the courage, and none has any strength one single guy was doing it, they could have thrashed him, but no one has the strength. Can you understand what is crippling our Indian society is that passiveness. How the passiveness has to be addressed, unless we, our leaders, because the problem is in, in assemblies, when, parliament, when the elected representatives watch pornography, while the sessions are going on. <laughs> so what kind of message people get it? This is what the, that's how it results in at a street level. For me, this is the, what we have to address these issues, unless, for me, democracy is something, all of us, be, it's easy, very easy to comment. It's very easy to say this is wrong, this is not, this is not possible. I, any a million people can comment, but how many people are actually can come onto the roads and participate in building of our democracy? How, how many people actually come physically? It's very easy. It's nice to be on, in, on the internet and on a Facebook to, see, to express your opinion. But in reality, if you come onto the roads, people are there to threaten you. People are there to intimidate you. And which had happened to me, which keeps happening to me. They keep threatening me. They keep saying that you can, you feel like express, you keep on expressing anything and one day we're going to bump you off. I said, I'm fine. But I'm not going to stop whatever, if there is a, the mistakes are there in society. If there are flaws in the society, if you want to bump me off, if you want to kill me, I'm fine, I'm ready for it. I, I'm prepared. No, because this is the love for my nation, because I don't want the future generations to suffer unless someone within my, this is my capacity, within my capacity, what best I can do, I will do. So before finishing this, I would like to say that to tell you the greatness of our country and to feel what we, because there's a, one of my favorite poet is there in Telugu. His name is Seshendra, late Seshendra. He passed away in 2006. His works were uh, shortlisted for uh, a Nobel Prize. And I would like to say that first in Telugu. Parvatam yavadiki vangi salam cheyato. Tufan Gunti Chitta Manada Mergado Samudra Mogadi Kala de Kurchan Mergado Nenanta Pritikin Mate Kaochikani Kalamitok Desa Janda Kunta Pogram
though I would like to, though it was not translated in, uh, I don't know whether they translated this in English or not, it is translated into Hindi and other languages, but I tried to translate, though I'm not a poet or I'm not, a, I'm not good in English, so I, I tried in my own way today morning. The mighty Himalayas will never bend down and salute. A roaring typhoon's voice will never be subservient. The deep ocean never barks at anyone. Maybe I'm a handful of dust, but if, I'm, if I raise my voice, you will see the pride and strength in me of my national flag. Let me say that one more thing, then I can, we'll say Bharat Mata Ki Jai. <laughs> Before finishing, I'd like to say this. India stands for dharma. India stands for truth. We are the land of Himalayas and historical Vindhyas. We love everyone, but we fear none. We respect everyone, but we surrender to none. And thank you, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. I'll just make an announcement for the Q and A. Yeah, sure, sure. Hi. So we have about 15 minutes for Q and A. Uh, we, I don't think we'll be able to take all questions. We'll start one that side and then one this side. So we can start that way. Hello, sir. My name is Rajani Pingli. You are my big inspiration. So I have a question here for you today. How can we contribute from our side to stop the farmers from committing suicides? How can we make the efforts of us and support from here and Genesena integrated with it so we can con conquer this problem? Farmer suicide is a loss of hope. When they don't see any future in what they were going, to, what they're going through, they commit suicide. I'd been to many families who had committed suicide. But the problem is, the hopelessness is not in reality; it is in the poverty of thought. When there is enough money to spend on extravagance of governments and uh, politicians, they can really address the issue. From Genesena point of view, what I'm trying to do is, first of all, you have to instill a lot of confidence, and a lot of people are there. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a lot of self-help groups who goes to the farmers, and with it, first of all, they need a hope to survive. They want to, they want to survive. So what I'm trying to do is I'm creating a self-help groups where they can go to the farmers who are in a depressing situation, and they're going to address them, and they're going to, sometimes it is a form of money, sometimes in a kind word, sometimes maybe supporting in different ways. That's what I'm trying to do, and which I'll be, you'll see the results later. Sir, um, I'm Naresh Kurabati. I'm, I'm an IAS aspirant. I want to serve my uh, people, so I'm, um, and I have actually, yesterday I tried to give a book to you. The book name is March. Uh, I couldn't reach you, so I have given the book like to some, some kind of animation. Yes, right? yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. sir. Um, my question uh, before asking my question, I have some few ex uh, things, sir. Uh, in India, in India, uh, okay. So, so has extreme ideology hindering the growth of country? Has extreme ideology hindering the growth of the country. Which extreme ideology? Uh, no, sir. I'm just uh, saying because there is a right-wing extreme ideology. Yeah, which yeah. I understand. Uh, what you're saying. Yeah. Which ideology would be suitable? Yeah. So there is no uh, same-sex marriage in India. Same-sex marriage is illegal in India. Yeah. So there are 4.2 gender, um, third genders, which doesn't have private rights in India. And there is a forcible nationalism that you have to stand up for the uh, stand up for playing yeah. anthems in everything. And there is an extreme left-wing ideology hindering the rights of tribes and killing policemen. Uh, so, 
So there are like extreme ideologies. Uh, and my question is basically there are extreme ideologies which are hindering the growth of the country. So I would like to know your opinion on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, you shot like a machine gun. Uh, you spoke about right-wing ideology. You talk about the extremities of ideology. That's a problem in our country. India is a complex country. We have so many verticals. There's so many th thoughts are prevailing thoughts in a society. Not one ideology is going to unite all of us. But the problem is we have to understand one left wing or one right wing doesn't really help India. Somewhere, understand you have to be on a middle path. You have to understand both the extremes. The problem is when you're saying, where is the need for a right wing? In right wing, if a fundamentalist of any religion, it could be any religion, for example, uh, I don't want to name the man, individual or name the religion, but that man was really putting down one religion, uh, gods of one religion. And for me, you're hurting my interest, you're hurting the gods I believe in. And now, what the, the problem is, none of the parties, because they do vote bank politics, they don't want to condemn the other guy, because it's going, they're going to lose the vote bank. They won't say it. So who steps in? The right wing steps in to cut, to, cut down the, to cut down them. So normally people go and get attracted. When they're, come, like when, if people who are very neutral, who can see at a very objective level, if someone is doing a mistake, irrespective of whether I believe in their ideology, that they belong to my tribe, you have to condemn them. That's what is lacking in our country because of your vote bank attitude. And uh, you're talking about the same gender, same, same gender, third gender. See, in India still, it's very painful. Yesterday I had uh, heard of uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Ms. Uh, Kalki Subramaniam. It is very painful. In fact, I was uh, giving an interview right now for the students of uh, Howard. So there is a, a women wing in our political parties. There is a man's, men wing in political parties. There is no third gender wing. When I heard a speech yesterday, though I have a lot of empathy for them, first time I felt as a political party, I don't know, the rest of the parties had done it, I want to create a third gender wing to address their woes and issues. I'm thankful to the conference. Hello. Yeah. Next question, please. Sir, my name is Ramara Udguru. I really like your stance to fight for the special status of Andhra Pradesh. And I would like to share some uh, quick ideas, uh, I mean, quick in one sentence. Build a united international movement by Telugus for the special status of Andhra Pradesh. See, for me, here, I'm not talking about, here I'm not talking about the discrete protests in some of the countries, uh, off and on. But it should be a united... Okay, okay. Yeah. I got it, I got it. Got it. No, no, I'm fine. I'm sorry. See, so special status issue, when government promises something, better they stand for it. If they can't stand for it, at least let them say why they're not, not able to stand by it. But simply just because you're there in the power and you can't throw your weight around and you said we can't do it. For, for me, special status is about the word taken back and there is no humility in them why they're not able to give it and that's what irks me. And that's what I'm fighting for. For, for me, whether you give it or not is the secondary. First, you are accountable and you promised us if you're going back on your word, better you come to us and tell us why you're going back. And that's what I'm fighting for. Quick, quick question. Quick. Hello, sir. My name is Saikran. I'm from Hyderabad. I'm a big admirer of you. And I've, question. What's your my question to you is, you have encouraged youth in politics and we are many of us are here because you have started a party named as Janasena. And my question to you is straight and simple. As you have encouraged youth, and we want to join the politics, and we see, we always see you surrounded by businessmen like Sharat Marar, or any producers, or any big political party people. But what is the chance that you communicate to the youth of the country, and how do you communicate to the youth of the country, or particularly our Telugu states, and how do you... See, I, ha yeah, I got it. I have my limitations to canvas for the entire country, because for me, primarily, I'm uh, kind of more confined to both the states, though I have a lot of connectivity around the world and the uh, entire country. But uh, primarily, I'm focusing on both the states and the uh, state of uh, Karnataka and uh, partly Tamil Nadu. 
And all over, there's a lot of youngsters who would like to be in politics, who would like to take, and not just every, everyone at a state level, maybe in their mandal level, at a taluk level, at a town level, they want to be in it. So what I'm trying to create is I'm trying to, cre first of all, right now for the last three years, I'm addressing issues because I want to walk what I'm talking. I want, unless I walk the talk, first of all, I don't want to put you at risk. I want you to believe me, okay, I'm capable of what I'm saying. And unless I walk the talk, I don't want to do anything. So right now, three years I've been doing it. Now, maybe a few six months from now, I'm creating that kind of uh, platforms where uh, enthusiastic like you or people like you will, will get an opportunity to attend the leadership programs. So that's what I'm trying to do.